Welcome, my people, to another Back in the Day classic movie review. The classic movie we'll be reviewing today is called Robinson Crusoe on Mars. It's an early 1964 version of the blockbuster Matt Damon movie titled The Martian. Okay, it came first before the idea of The Martian, but once you take a look at this, you'll see what I mean. It almost appears to be a later version of The Martian, not because of the setup, not because of special effects, but because while the Matt Damon character was alone on Mars for the whole duration, this character is not. The first half of the movie, yes. The second half of the movie, no. In this movie, we have astronaut Kit Draper seemingly stranded on Mars alone and we watch as he goes through all the stuff he needs to do in order to survive. What I love so much about this movie is that it takes the Matt Damon Martian story that one step further by introducing another character. The Robinson Crusoe book character of Friday. The stranded astronaut even calls this guy Friday. Now bear with me as I give you a bit of a setup. This movie was filmed in 1964, so it has 1964 era special effects, meaning they're elementary by today's standard. For the most part, this movie was filmed in Death Valley because it had the terrain of what many envisioned was the landscape of Mars. Likewise, for the movie The Martian, it was primarily filmed in Wadi Rum, a protected desert wilderness in southern Jordan. Wadi Rum had a unique and otherworldly type of landscape that contributed to the film's realistic portrayal of the red Martian planet environment. Now as for this movie, it has 1960s era special effects, which weren't all that special by today's standards. But for 1964, they were pretty good. You'll notice some of the landscape scenes look like paintings. And that's because it is. That was a popular technique back in the day, combining a painted background with live action to give it the illusion and feel of an expansive Mars scenery. They also used practical and visual effects miniatures and studio settings for the filming. Digital nor CGI existed back then, so keep that in mind while watching this movie. The special effects go from not too bad to pretty much okay to kind of cheesy, but it doesn't disengage the viewer from the story. The first half of the movie deals with Draper on the planet alone. The second half deals with the Friday character, who's an escaped slave that had been used by some aliens that we only see briefly to mine minerals on the planet. He's controlled by metal bands around his wrist, and the bad guy aliens spend a good portion of the movie trying to find him. But he's so deep in the caverns with the Draper character that they really can't track him well. But the fact that he's wearing these bands cause him some discomfort when they're looking for him. The dynamics between Draper and Friday isn't like that of the book, Robinson Caruso, which is kinda over the top. In the book, Friday is a servant to me bordering on being a slave and Caruso being his master. Yet the Friday in this story, while ethnically different than Draper, the interplay isn't so hardcore, I'm the boss of you and you obey me. While I don't find the interplay between the two offensive, especially with me being a person of color, there was a time or two when it danced close to a line for me. One being where Draper told Friday he was going to learn English, literally demanding it while he made no attempt to learn Friday's language. Still, 
for the most part, the story is about two guys trying to survive in a really messed up situation. Like the movie The Martian, this movie deals with isolation, the ingenuity one has to tap into when it means their survival, the drive to survive, and I feel dealing with one's own prejudices and notions about someone not exactly like them, meaning characters have to grow. Well, peeps, that's the setup. I think now we can get into this movie. And there you have the pair of spaceship uh, being about their mission of orbiting Mars. And here we see co-pilot Dan McReady played by TV Batman Adam West. Listen, Mona, this banana paste is meant for your survival only. Besides, I just gave you some. Mac's gonna break your heart when you have to eject that little buddy of yours in a capsule. I'm not. We'll make our remaining orbits and start back. Mona stays with us. You're the skipper, Colonel. We've got enough animal data, haven't we, Mona? Even Diane sent that one to you. But... He's listening to tapes from home. What do you think? I'm thinking. Look at that. Whew! Mars is burning up. Oh, I'm glad Mona doesn't have to go down into that fire swamp. Yeah. Now, what'll I fix for dinner? How about some turkey with mashed potatoes? Gravy added. I like mine in paste form, you know, in a tube. <laughs> I think the diner can fix it that way. There's always beef steak and French fried onions also in a squeeze tube. We had that for breakfast, you know. Uh -oh, Unidentified flying on. mass. Dead ahead. Collision course. Fire main retros. Firing main retros. Firing up a retros. We're in a descending orbit. Decaying fast, my friend. Mars gravity's taking over, pulling us down. Calling NASA. Calling NASA. Colonel Dan McCready, commanding Mars Gravity Probe 1. Forced out of orbital velocity to avoid collision with planetoid. And into tighter orbit of Mars. The gravity of the planet's pulling us toward it. We've got to blast back into orbital velocity. Use all our fuel. That problem we can lick later. I see. We'll blast again. Delta velocity. Delta V, okay. That's our fuel. 
NASA Earth satellite to Mars Gravity Probe 1. Do not dissemble space vehicle until all other procedures have been tried. Prepare to eject. Emergency procedure. Ready, Mac. So long and good luck. Okay, kid. I'll see you when we join up. So, not being able to uh, find a, a clip I could use, you're going to see me interspersing still uh, photographs in those occasions where I can't find a clip. But, I'll clue you in on what's going on. In this particular scene, you see the ship that Dan and Kip are in, and as they just discussed, they're making plans to eject out and also plans to hook up once both of their separate ships have landed. So here we see first Kip Draper ejecting out of the command module. And once he's a safe distance away, uh, co-pilot Dan McReady will then eject out of the command module in his own space capsule. And like to both just discuss, they plan on hooking up after they've both landed. Uh, here's a shot of the fiery planet that the both intend to uh, land on. For the longest time, Mars was always seen as not simply just the red planet, but a fiery planet, uh, believing that all this redness was due to the planet continuously being on fire. And so this was a mindset that hung around for quite a while until, uh, I guess, our stronger telescopes uh, just zeroed in and really didn't see fire, but just a uh, deep red terrain. And thus, the red planet. Here we see uh, Draper's ship landing, surrounded by uh, fire. And you can't beat these 1964 uh, special effects. Uh, again, they can be a little bit on the cheesy side, but uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I think they're pretty good for, uh, for that day. And now we have Draper's space capture crash landing on Mars. And here we see the crash landed ship. We can barely glimpse out Draper inside. And here we see Draper exiting the capsule. And so you can see a bit of a glare or a tint in uh, Draper's visor, just giving you a glimpse of the uh, fiery uh, and inhospitable environment this guy has landed in. Uh, he's looking around and I'm sure he's not believing what he himself is seeing. The landscape is uh, harsh, fiery, and uh, unforgiving, as I have heard it described in the past. But uh, to be honest with you, some still find that it is worth the adventure. Uh, here it is, 2024, and uh, from our standpoint, when I say our, I mean contemporaries, I'll throw myself in there even though I'm uh, retired, uh, so that's how old I am. But there are those adventurers among us who haven't taken uh, a trip to Mars off the table. You know, the fact that it'll take months to get there, in many cases it'll be a one-way trip, uh, and the planet being the hostile planet it is, uh, you would have people, I believe, still lining up to go. I think in uh, an earlier day in a different time that somebody might have uh, at least included me a little bit, perhaps. Kip is out of the capsule. He's sitting down and uh, taking a visual of exactly where he's at and, for lack of another term, what he's gotten himself into. Uh, you can't get away from the fact uh, life was rosy 
on uh, the command module. And now, being on this planet, he's in the thick of it. Uh, the Matt Damon uh, character in the movie The Martian at least had a habitat uh, in which to live. This guy has no such thing. And looking at that capsule, it looks like it was only big enough for him to sit in it and ride down to the planet in. Uh, that capsule doesn't look like it's large enough to sustain him. Which means he's going to have to find shelter and he's going to have to think about finding shelter fairly quickly because he's out there in the elements and not earth elements, Mars elements. And now we see the uh, command module circling Mars. It's apparently close enough in orbit. And so now we see Dan McReady as he prepares himself to launch his space capsule out of the failed and failing command module. All right, so he's at the controls and he's getting ready to punch himself out of the command module. And there he is, Dan McReady launching himself out of the command module. So we see here Draper looking around his uh, environment and it is really and truly a hot mess of a spot. As he's looking around his environment, he's casting glances up into the sky looking for Dan McReady's uh, space capsule. As he's looking up, he spots Dan's space capsule making its way to the Mars surface. I think Draper marks off in his mind where he can surmise where Dan has landed. Now we see that Draper has turned back to his space capsule, and what he's going to do now is rummage through it to see what he can salvage. I'm sure based upon his training, he knows he has a long road to hoe uh, in front of him as he and Dan wait for a rescue. It's very, very fortunate for them that they were able to get a distress mayday out to NASA before they had to eject out of the command module. You see how small this capsule actually looks? Uh, it most assuredly uh, was not built to be a uh, survival type craft, but just something to get you off of the command module if something went amiss. Uh, this thing definitely was not built to house you until rescue came. But looking at their mission, it wasn't to land on Mars, it was to orbit Mars, uh, obtain some data, and then send the monkey down to uh, down to Mars. So I'm assuming it's a little monkey space capsule uh, that was somewhere on the uh, command module that they were going to use to send little monkey Mona uh, down to the fiery planet to finish up the assignment. Here, Draper has retrieved a radio from the capsule, and what he's doing is trying to reach out to Dan McReady. He's calling him, he's calling him, but he's not getting any response back. Having done the best he could do for the moment, Draper starts to look for some place to shelter out the night. Uh, he walks a few yards from the space capsule, and he sees this sort of opening, a cave, where he feels he can at least uh, stay the night while he waits for contact from Dan McReady. So here we find Draper snoozing away in the little cave. Later we see Draper outside of the cave. There's a little fire going on. You can see up in the corner. And what he's doing is he's trying to warm himself, warm his hands uh, at the fire. Uh, but what he does not realize is that uh, Martian, apparently uh, Martian fire is mobile. 
And so uh, if you were looking at an actual video, you would see the fire starts to move and then starts to literally chase him and he's running, trying to get away from it. So it is uh, kind of quite comical in the middle of this very dramatic uh, situation. One thing the rolling fire does is that it calls attention to these lava-like rocks that are dispersed around the area. What you can't see, but what Draper sees, is smoke coming off these rocks. He gets closer to the rocks, reach out and touches them, and discover that the rocks are actually very hot. He takes a tool out of his satchel and hits the rock and the rock splits in two. He picks one of the halves up and discover it is really very, very hot. So it gives him an idea that he transferred to something else can warm him if he's able to somehow pick it up and carry it with him and it clues them in that these particular rocks are like coal. They can be set on fire and like coal generate heat. Hey! You gotta be careful where you step. This is a dangerous planet and it is not your friend. It is not trying to help you or save you. One thing that's realized in the movie is that the Martian air is very, very thin. So he sees the flammable rocks, but he's also looking up and sees a very wide opening to what he can assume is a very wide cave. He's looking for something more than the temporary shelter that he had the night before. He's looking for a place that's going to have to protect him and shelter him for quite a while. He's looking at his oxygen gauge. He's only got so much oxygen. And eventually, he's going to have to figure out how to get around that. Just like if you remember Mark Watney, who had to get around oxygen, water, growing those potatoes. And what did he do? He handled each problem one by one. Handling one problem, solving it, then going on to the next problem and solving that, and the next one and solving that. What he did was he literally broke his situation up into pieces. And that's what made him being stranded, Mark Waltney being stranded, more palatable, easier, doable. Now we see Kit. He has found a pretty good home, but here's his struggle, his frustrating struggle, and that is trying to figure out how to light these lava kind of rocks on fire. Now, you saw he picked up a book of matches and what looks like to be some type of a crystal rock that he's found.
Now we know every kid on planet Earth knows how to take a, a crystal or a piece of glass and holding it against the object using the sun to create a fire. So this is what Kip is doing. He's got the sun. He's got that glass crystal. He's got the lava rock. What is he missing? And then he thinks, wait a minute. Maybe if I add a little oxygen, I can get a fire going. You notice he doesn't keep the oxygen on all the time. He puts his oxygen on in bursts. And there you have it, there's the fire. So, his method works. He has shelter, now he has fire. This is Commander Christopher Draper, the Navy of the United States of America, Planet Earth. Former co-pilot, Mars Gravity Probe 1. On our third orbit of this planet, we took evasive action to avoid collision with a meteor and were forced into dangerous gravitational pull of Mars. We were forced to abandon ship. As of now, the vehicle frame is still orbiting Mars. Seems to have established gravitational balance. We ejected capsule without incident. Colonel Dan McCready ejecting after I did. I'll set out to look for him tomorrow. From all indications, he should be on the other side of a high range of rocky peaks to the west. Now, my two most difficult problems are air and water. I have, with what's left in my tank and one reserve cylinder, enough oxygen for oh, about 60 hours, depending, of course, on how much I exert myself. My first discovery was that the air on Mars is far too thin to support human life. As to water, by severe rationing, I can get by for about 15 days. Of course, once my air gives out, water won't matter. First positive survival point. I found a yellow rock. It's as burnable as some of our poorer grades of coal. Heat's uneven, but it should make the Martian nights endurable. Feel a little bit like Columbus, set down in a strange new land full of new wonders, new discoveries. It's a challenge, all right. Challenge to my training. Sometimes challenges can get mighty big. But I'm going to stay alive, believe me. That's for the morale officer. And so as you can see, 
his tank ran out of air while he was sleeping. Well, I've licked the heat and shelter problem. Breeding, that's a different story. Moving about, exerting myself, I found that I can breathe the air of Mars for about 12 to 15 minutes before I need to take air from my tank for a booster. Lying down, asleep, inactive, I can get by for an hour before taking a booster. In this way, with some discomfort, I can conserve my oxygen supply. At the most optimistic appraisal, I have 50 or so hours of life left, God willing. The problem is sleeping. If I don't wake up in time to renew my air supply, it's hearts and flowers. I've got to make some kind of alarm device to safeguard myself. Tomorrow, and morning's only a couple of hours away, I'm going to rejoin Mac. Good old Mac. I bet he's got these problems with him. For 1964, these effects are really, really good. And there's the uh, command module just stuck in orbit, going around in a circle. Goodness, brother, how far are you walking? I think he sees uh, McReady's uh, capsule. That puts some life in him. just running over there. Now he's looking around saying, well, if the capsule is up there, he's got to be down here somewhere.
Uh-oh. Okay, this doesn't look good. A broken off piece of the capsule is down there. Oh, wow. You alone for sure now. Your friend uh, didn't make the land. And... and so what he does is he peeps inside and yeah, he sees Dan McReady's broken body. He did not survive the uh, landing. And that's really, that's really tough. That's a bite because you go from, I'm only by myself here for a minute until I hook up with Dan tomorrow. You go from that to there's Dan, there's his ship. I'm not alone anymore. And then you go from that to, oh, wow, this guy didn't make it. I'm all alone again. And I'm all alone for real. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can endure if you have someone enduring it with you. You can be stranded on Mars with another person, but being stranded on Mars by yourself is really, really tough. Even though uh, the Matt Damon character did it wonderfully, but he didn't have the struggles this guy uh, is going to have to deal with. You know, uh, again, the Matt Damon character had a whole habitat. He had a way to eventually communicate because he had laptops and computers and things of that nature. He uh, jumped on the rover, went and found Pathfinder, whereby they could really, once he got that thing hooked up, they could really uh, talk to each other. He was growing food. He jury rigged up being able to get water and keeping the uh, oxygenator going. And so even though Matt was by himself, he was by himself in a better environment, in a better situation. Uh, this situation this guy is in, uh, personally with the roving uh, fireballs and things of that nature, I would be thinking that this planet is not my friend and this planet is pretty much going to try its best to take me down and take me out. That's how I would be feeling if I was Draper. Uh, he's sad as heck because uh, the realization is upon him that he is alone, alone for real. So he buries his friend in the harsh Martian soil and makes his goodbye. Now he sees the recorder that uh, Dan had earlier as he was listening to tapes from his family. So he takes the recorder ring that Dan was wearing, a chain that he was wearing, uh, he finds a photograph of Dan's family. He takes these and he puts them in a bag to take back with him when he returns home to give to Dan's family. He has hope, right? And he's showing he has hope, right? Because what he's doing is collecting these items. And so there's hope in his heart that he will return home to Earth one day. And so here he is, tucking the precious items away in a bag. Draper stands, makes his final goodbye with a salute to his friend and comrade. And just as he turns to leave, what do you think he sees? It's Mona the monkey. So to a certain extent, he isn't quite alone, is he? For one, he appreciates the company that Mona is going to give him. But number two, 
Mona has little air tanks attached to her back that Draper most assuredly is going to confiscate and use. With Mona being so little and so small, she's more adaptable to the thin air than Draper is. So Draper salvages what he can from McCready's capsule and then uh, he grabs Mona and they head back to the cave, which is his Mars home. Once Draper and Mona return back to the cave, uh, Draper is exhausted and he needs a couple puffs of air from one of Mona's tanks. This guy is going to have to figure out how to get air or he isn't going to last very long. And ultimately, he does figure out how to generate air. And so here in this scene, the guy is on his last leg. He is on his last couple of puffs of air. And he says, you know what? Forget rationing food. Mona, you might as well have your feel because I'm just about out of air. I'm on my last leg. Eat till you can't eat anymore. He is feeding Mona. And what happens is he passes out but he passes out close to where the fire is. Not close enough to be burned because for the most part the fire is out and the rocks are just embering, if you will. But as he's laying there, he literally feels air. Somehow, not only do these rocks burn, but after they've burned so much or perhaps burned down so far, they emit oxygen. And so what Draper does is figure out how to get the oxygen from the rocks into the container so he can breathe. And he literally figures it out. So he has shelter, he has oxygen, but now he's going to soon be running out of food. Again, one problem after the other, but problems are to be figured out, which he does. And Mona is the one that helps him to figure out his water issue. What happens is that during the day, Mona disappears. She disappears and sometime later she comes back. But what Draper is noticing is that when she comes back, She's not hungry, she isn't thirsty. What he surmises is this chick is getting food and water from some place. So what he does is he stops feeding her and he stops giving her water. Well, it doesn't take long for her to get hungry and thirsty and so she takes off and he follows her. And as he follows her, he stumbles on to her hidden cache, if you will, of food and water. And so there you have it. The water she's been drinking and these pods she's been eating. So Draper tries the pods out, tries the water out. He's still alive and fit after drinking and eating. And so now that's a problem that's been taken care of shelter, air, food, and water, and to a certain extent company because he has little Mona. Yet even though he's not technically alone because Mona is there, Draper is starved for human companionship and so he begins to hallucinate. Mac, what's bugging you? For God's sake, say hello to me. What are you sore about? Oh, Mac, you can't act this way. Mac, I haven't heard a human voice in four months. Four, Mac. I haven't heard your voice. Mac, say anything to me, please. For God's sake, talk to me, say anything. Oh, God, please. Talk to me, say anything. Please.
All right. Here's another note for you boys in survival. For you geniuses and human factors. A guy can lick the problems of heat, water, shelter, food. I know I've done it. And here's the hairiest problem of all. Isolation. Being alone. Boy, here's where he'll crack. Here's where he'll go under. I know, I know, I had great training, including two months in the isolation chamber. But when I was in that chamber, I knew I was coming out. I knew I'd be with people again. But up here on Mars, you gotta face the reality of being alone forever. Now the Friday character is introduced. Seeing an alien spaceship, Draper investigates and crosses paths with the escaped slave. He takes him home and they each have to work at building a level of trust. Friday watches Draper using the breathing machine he built and he realizes Draper uses it to breathe in the thin Martian atmosphere. Friday has these oxygen pills that he uses and he offers one to Draper. Draper says, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not taking some pill I don't know and don't understand. And he continues to use his system of breathing and leaves Friday to use his. During one particular scenario where the bad alien guys are trying to find Friday and they're uh, tossing uh, explosives all over the place, Draper gets trapped in an ash-like downpour and he stops breathing. Friday puts a pill in his mouth, helps him to swallow the pill, and Draper is fine. He's able to breathe better than he's breathed since he landed on Mars. And so what ends up happening is Draper puts aside his method and goes with Friday's method, which is to use his pills. Unknown to Draper is that Friday is taking less and less of the pills himself, saving them for Draper. What? No, 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 stone. What? Listen, Victoria, okay, see, I don't know now, what you're trying to tell me. My... We're not budging from this spot until you learn some name words. Are you okay? Calling. Are you okay? More name No, calling. idiot, Stone! Are you okay? Stone. No. See? He's not taking the pills. He's rationing them so that his friend Draper Quick can have the pills. Up. You call Mars. Yes, Mars. Those look like the canals of Mars. You mean these are part of the canals of Mars? And this is what happens when the spaceships are looking for runaway slaves because he's got these bars around his wrists. And the problem is, either they're going to find Friday or they're going to destroy everything looking for them. Draper decides that, you know what? We need to move to one of the polar areas where these guys aren't going to be prone to look for you. We need to leave where we are and go there. This would be safest for you. As you can see, the polar region is just brutal. Mining has to be impossible here, so there's clearly no threat there from the alien ships. Space Rescue Group 3 to Earth Satellite. One more fact to report. The meteor that struck Mars is melting the polar ice cap. Not enemy. Talk like you. Like me. Like me, Friday. Uh, this is Commander Christopher Draper of the United States Navy. My God, a voice from Mars!
And there you have it, my people. Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Can I say again, this is a pretty good movie. If you guys can do a little searching and find the full movie, maybe on YouTube, maybe somewhere else, I'm telling you, you really do need to take a look at it. Uh, this humble little posting of it uh, did not do this movie justice and cannot do the movie justice. It really, really is a pretty decent uh, Mars type movie. Well, that's it for now. If you'd like to see more content like this, come on, you really do need to subscribe, like, share, and just show up. Leave some comments again. Leave a comment if you'd like for me to chat about a movie in particular. Uh, okay, now we need to discuss this. <laughs> Since I'm inviting this, I'm not inviting scary movies. Not doing it. I don't look at a scary movie. I don't want to talk about a scary movie. I don't want to deal with a scary trailer. I don't see scary movies, okay? I had an incident some years ago called The Ring that put me off scary movies for the rest of my life and eternity. And perhaps one day I will share that messed up experience uh, with you. But for now, if there's a movie... Uh, or, or and especially classics. I love classics. So, if there's a movie you want to chat about, if there's a classic you've heard about, wanted to know, and if you want to know if it's something that I've seen, and you want to ask me some questions concerning it, uh, how I feel about it, hey, feel free in the comments. That's it for now, my people. I'll see you next time.